Welcome to a truly outrageous episode of Cinematic Excrement. And if that line didn't already give it away, and if you didn't see the title or the thumbnail for some reason, the subject of today's review is the ill-fated and ill-advised movie, Gem and the Holograms. Oh, I remember when the trailer for this movie first hit YouTube. And I remember the collective gasp of disbelief that emanated from the internet. I don't think anyone was surprised that they were making a live-action Gem and the Holograms movie. The Hasbro Toy Company had already released several live-action movies based on other properties, with varying degrees of success, so it was really just a matter of time. No, the surprise came from just how badly they appeared to have screwed it up. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I did know it bore almost no resemblance to the gem I grew up with. If you're not familiar with the cartoon on which the movie is loosely based, very loosely, it's about a woman named Jerrica Benton, owner of record label Starlight Music. Her late father bequeathed her a holographic computer with a form of artificial intelligence called Synergy. Using this holographic technology to alter her appearance, she adopts the alter ego Gem, and she forms a band with her sister Kimber and their friends Aja and Shayna, known as Gem and the Holograms. The show follows their many adventures as rock superstars and their rivalry with another band called the Misfits, haha, <laughs> no, and their sinister manager, Eric Raymond. And yeah, I watched the cartoon when I was a kid, and I am not ashamed to admit that. I was hardly the only boy that did. Sure, we may not have been in the target audience. The show, after all, was all about... Yeah, that. But for a show that was clearly designed for little girls, it still had some stuff to keep the boys interested. Personally, I was drawn to the science fiction element of the show. Not only was Synergy a talking computer... Because everyone in the 80s wanted a talking computer. But she was able to project a lifelike hologram of virtually anything. This was awesome! Was it in any way realistic? Hell no, but I was a dumb child, I didn't care. Also, for a show primarily aimed at little girls, it was surprisingly violent. I don't think there was a single episode of this show where someone did not almost die. We were watching little girls cartoons before it was cool. Suck it, bronies. The show may have been incredibly cheesy, it was the 80s after all, the stories didn't always make much sense, and the animation was pretty terrible by today's standards. But I enjoyed it at the time, and I still look back on it with fond memories. And like many of you, my inner child cried out in terror when that godforsaken trailer was unleashed upon the public. It looked like they took Gem and the Holograms, sucked all the life out of it, and shat out a generic story about teenage girls becoming pop stars. What were they thinking? Reactions across the board were overwhelmingly negative. Some people expressed sadness, others anger, and many just plain bewilderment. People on YouTube hated it, people on Twitter hated it, hell, even Jem herself hated it. What the f was that? That video is hilarious and you all need to watch it if you haven't already. Link in the description. I mean, finish watching this first, but you know, after you're done. Go ahead. With such a generic story, it certainly looked like the studio was putting the minimal amount of effort into this adaptation of Gem. To make matters worse, Christy Marks, who created the characters for the original cartoon, was denied involvement with the movie. They didn't even want her as a consultant. They did eventually agree to give her the briefest of cameos, but that's it. They didn't seem to want much help from women in general, come to think of it. The writer, the director, six producers, all dudes. Now, call me crazy, but if you're making a movie with a predominantly female cast for, I presume, a predominantly female audience, one would think you'd want just a little bit of input from the ladies. God damn it, Hollywood, this isn't rocket science. The studio quickly realized they had some serious damage control to do. Unfortunately, they couldn't even get that right. During an interview with Topless Robot, producer Jason Blum tried to assure fans that their fears were unfounded. It is 100% true to the spirit of Jem. Like, 100%. And I think that people will be very pleasantly surprised. So in that way, it's good. Maybe lowering expectations is good. But I think people will be pleasantly surprised, for sure. Maybe lowering expectations is good. Motherfucker actually said this. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg of you, if you work in marketing, or if you are considering a career in marketing, learn from the mistakes of Jason Blum. Never tell your audience to lower their expectations. That's just fucking stupid.
Granted, in this case, it was probably good advice, but still, you're not supposed to say that! Well, I think we've talked about the trailer enough. Let's get into the actual movie and see if it is, in fact, 100% true to the spirit of Jem. Spoiler alert, no. So in the original cartoon, in addition to being huge rock stars, Jem and the Holograms ran a foster home for girls. But in the movie, they are the foster girls. For some reason. Jerrica's father died when she was eight, so she and her sister Kimber were sent to live with their Aunt Bailey, played by Molly Ringwald. How the hell did they get her in this movie? And her two foster children, Aja and Shayna. Don't ask me what happened to Jerrica and Kimber's mother. For some reason, she's never mentioned. That's a little weird. Although, come to think of it, the cartoon had the same problem. I don't think they even acknowledged the mother's existence until late in the second season, so oddly enough, that's one thing the movie got right. Jerrica, or Jem as she is later known, is played by Aubrey Peoples, who you might remember as Finn's daughter Claudia in the first Sharknado movie. But she was unable to reprise her role in Sharknado 3 as she was busy making Jem and the Holograms. I'm not sure she made the right choice. And I'm not so sure Miss Peoples thinks she made the right choice either. Her performance as Jerrica is rather uninspired to say the least, and I can understand why since the script doesn't really give her much to work with. Her character is just plain boring. Really, the only thing the movie tells us about Jerrica is she can sing. And to be fair, Peoples is a very good singer, but singing alone does not make a compelling character. She definitely does not pass the Red Letter Media character test. Shayna is even worse. I can't even call her character boring since she doesn't even do enough to bore me. She's just... there. Kimber and Aja at least have something that resembles a personality. Kimber is the bright, bubbly one that shares every minute detail of her personal life on the internet, and Aja is the badass who likes technology. Shayna... exists. This is a far cry from the cartoon where Shayna was a strong, intelligent, talented woman who played multiple instruments and worked as a fashion designer. She even started her own clothing line at one point. Shayna in the movie is... I don't even know. I got nothing. They do briefly hint at her passion for fashion in the opening scenes, but that's all we get. Otherwise, she's just a teenage girl, living with three other teenage girls. That's about it. Why exactly was it necessary to make them girls in the movie instead of grown-ass women? Did they think no one would go see the movie unless they were teenagers for some reason? Because I would love to see the market research that led them to that conclusion so I can wipe my ass with it. I'm pretty sure any kids who see this movie are not going to care how close in age they are to the main characters, and any adults who grew up with the cartoon are just going to be terribly confused. Anyway, the birth of the gem persona comes when Jerrica decides to put on a wig and colorful makeup and records herself singing and playing guitar. If nothing else, she does at least look like the gem from the cartoon. Oddly enough, she decides to record this song in the middle of the damn night. I'm surprised Aja isn't pounding on her door screaming, Hey, Jerrica! Some of us are trying to sleep here! We do have... something... to do in the morning. Probably. What do they do all day? Are they students? Are they working? The movie never makes that clear. Then they upload the video to YouTube. In record time, it seems. I wish my uploads went that fast. And somehow they skipped the processing time and the video was instantly ready for viewing. That's not how YouTube works! First you upload the video, then when that's done, another progress bar pops up for processing the video. When it's done processing, then it's ready for viewing. Oh, and during processing, it has to stall at 95% for two fucking hours for no apparent reason. What is it about that last 5% that makes it take longer than the other 95% combined? The world may never know. Anyway, the video goes viral overnight, which attracts the attention of the owner of Starlight Music, Erica Raymond, a gender-swapped version of Eric Raymond, played by Juliette Lewis. And she immediately offers Jem a record deal and three shows in the Los Angeles area. All that for one viral video. One. And if you think that sounds incredibly stupid, hang on, there's more. According to the movie, Jem's video got about 36,000 views. Now, that's not bad, especially for your first upload ever. 36,000 hits in 24 hours is pretty damned impressive. But nobody is going to offer you a record deal on the spot for one song that 36,000 people listen to. 
Even Justin Bieber didn't get that lucky, and hell, while I freely admit this is not typical for my channel, I have a handful of videos with over 200,000 views, and you don't see anybody offering me a TV deal. If you're going to have the internet play a big part in your movie, it might be helpful to know just how the internet actually works. So Jerrica emails Erica, hey, they rhyme, and what follows is a rather bizarre conversation. There's a point where Erica sends an email that just has an ellipsis, and a moment later, Jerrica does the same thing. Why would you do that? If you don't have anything to say, don't say anything. In any case, Erica agrees to sign Jerrica and her sisters and picks them up the next day with her... driver? Bodyguard? Assistant? Gimp? Whatever this guy is supposed to be. Zipper. My name is Zipper, ma'am. Is it? Is it really? I know they had a guy named Zipper on the TV show, but I never thought for one second that was actually his real name. And after a brief chat, they're off to Los Angeles where Jem meets her future love interest, Rio, played by Ryan Guzman. And in this version of the story, Rio is Erica's son. I have no idea why. He's also supposed to be a college intern, even though he does not look nearly young enough for that. I can believe Jerrica is 18. I do not believe for one second that Rio was in his early 20s. Motherfucker, you look 30. Now that they have arrived at Starlight Music, it's time to transform these four girls into the world's latest and greatest musical act. That means changing the way you act, the way you sound, and the way you look. Does it also mean being incredibly heavy-handed with your message? Because if so, you're doing a bang-up job. Apparently, Jerrica's earrings do not fit their new manufactured style, so Erica holds onto them for safekeeping. Believe it or not, this is actually a plot point, and we'll come back to it later. Speaking of the plot, if you saw the trailer, you already know the rest of the story, because they pretty much spoiled the entire thing. They do exactly one show as a group, which is somehow successful despite a power failure, but then Erica asks Jem to ditch her sisters and offers her a solo contract. Aunt Bailey is on the verge of bankruptcy as her store is not doing so well. I have no idea what kind of store it is. They only ever refer to it as the store. She probably sells sex toys. So since she desperately needs the money, Jem signs the contract immediately without even mentioning it to her sisters. They of course find out and tell Jem to go fuck herself, a situation that easily could have been prevented had she just explained the situation. But that would require Jem to not be a complete moron, and apparently we can't have that. Then Jem turns into Lady Gaga 2.0 and does one solo performance, and immediately afterward, she makes peace with her sisters and all is right with the world. And I do mean immediately. From breakup to makeup takes about eight minutes of running time. I'm not kidding. We should have just told us the truth from the beginning, Jay. I would say, well, then we wouldn't have a movie. But... You know what? Eight minutes of running time in a movie that clocks in at just under two hours? No. No, we'd still have a movie. So what the fuck was the point? And so the band is back together, Jem hooks up with Rio, and they all live crappily ever after the end. That's pretty much the story in a nutshell, and I'm sure it's a story you've heard many times before. But how Jem and the Holograms chooses to tell this story is where it gets weird. This movie is also a treasure hunt. Let me explain. Back when Jerrica was little, her father was working on some kind of robot, which he called Synergy, although the name was spelled 51N3RG.Y. Probably for some bullshit trademark reason. This movie was brought to you by the same people who brought you the Siffy channel, after all. Daddy Benton never got to finish the robot, but Jerrica has been lugging it around ever since for sentimental reasons. But after they arrive in Los Angeles, it suddenly wakes up and starts doing... stuff. Welcome to the Synergy Operating System. Powered by Windows Vista. We apologize in advance. Coming into LA, we must have activated a GPS trigger. Oh, I don't know about that. GPS requires power to operate, and I find it a little hard to swallow that Synergy's GPS could operate for 10 years and its battery would still have a charge. Synergy has a few pieces missing, and it's up to the girls to find them. Fortunately, the robot is kind enough to project maps to where they need to go. So instead of using the Synergy computer from the cartoon with its super-advanced holographic technology, they decided to just copy Earth to Echo. Weak. 
Synergy also occasionally projects old home movies of Daddy Benton and Jerrica, but Kimber is strangely absent from nearly all of these videos. Guess we know who Daddy's favorite was. Stranger still, Kimber doesn't seem the least bit bothered by getting snubbed by her late father. That's just... What the fuck? So the first map takes them to a secret compartment at the Santa Monica Pier. Don't ask me how Daddy set that up. It also nearly leads to the girls getting arrested since they had to hop the fence after hours to get in there. I can't go back to juvie. Fine. Wait a minute. Did Aja just say, I can't go back to juvie? There is a story there, and I'm willing to bet it's more exciting than what we're watching now. Fortunately, Rio shows up to rescue them, and they're free to move on to the next point on the map. The Open Air Club. Conveniently, that just happens to be the same location where the girls are scheduled to give their first concert. And while they're performing, Jerrica just happens to spot her father's old guitar hanging on the wall. Again, don't ask me how Daddy Benton set this up, and don't ask me why he thought it would even work since it requires far too many things to go exactly right. But they open the guitar and find the second missing piece. And now they have one more piece to find to complete their quest. And you'll never believe how stupid this is. You remember those earrings Jerrica had at the beginning of the movie? The earrings are the final piece. Unfortunately, Erica has them locked away in a safe in her office, so they decide they have no choice but to break into Starlight Records and steal them back. Now, disregarding the fact that there is no reason whatsoever for Erica to keep Jem's earrings in her personal safe, there's a simple solution to all of this. All they have to do is just walk up to Erica and say, Excuse me, Miss Raymond, I believe you have some of my personal property. I'd like it back, please. Done. Problem solved. And they don't even have to sneak into the building to do it. Rio is the owner's son. And he works there. He should be able to just waltz right in the front door without any trouble. But no. Apparently, their first and only solution is breaking and entering. Does anyone else get the feeling these people couldn't count past 10 without taking off their shoes? So they break into Erica's office and easily open her safe since the password is her freaking name. She's the CEO of a major record label, and her password is her fucking name. I totally buy that. No, for real, if there's one thing I've learned from working in the computer industry for so long, people are incredibly stupid when it comes to security. That's probably the most believable thing in this movie, really. So they grab the earrings and plug them into Synergy, and what is their great reward for completing this unnecessarily complicated fetch quest? A goodbye video message from Daddy Benton to Jerrica. Again, only addressed to Jerrica, not to Kimber though he does at least have the good sense to mention her name once, so good for him for at least remembering his other daughter exists. And that's literally all they get for completing Synergy. A video message. Which he easily could have just burned to a DVD and placed in a safe deposit box instead of forcing his daughter to go on this bizarre scavenger hunt that almost got her arrested. Twice. Father of the fucking century right there. And this whole thing had jack shit to do with the plot. It's pure padding. Oh, but there's one more thing. Apparently, Rio's father also passed away many years ago. Seems to be a running theme in this movie. And inside Erica's safe, in addition to the earrings, they find a copy of his last will and testament, in which he bequeaths Starlight Records to his son. So Rio is now in charge of the company, and Erica gets shown the door. Well, how nice for him. Still don't know why they felt the need to change the story from the cartoon so Starlight Records was owned entirely by the Raymond family instead of the Bentons. God forbid they make Jerrica a powerful businesswoman. No, 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 no. Having her be a stupid teenager is clearly much better. Well, that's the story of Gem and the Holograms. Actually, I'm not going to call it Gem and the Holograms anymore. I'm going to call it Gino. Gem in name only. So... As I was saying, Gino is an absolute mess. It's stupid, nonsensical, and it most certainly is not 100% in the spirit of Jem. And throwing in a few random lines from the cartoon doesn't change that. Showtime synergy. Outrageous. Jem is glamour and glitter, fashion and fame. Hey, 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 fuck you, real.
Now, I'm not saying anyone adapting a nostalgic property has to copy it exactly. Of course, you're allowed to make a few changes. But the changes have to make sense. For Gino, it feels like they made changes purely for the sake of making changes. Why did they make Jerrica and her sisters a bunch of teenagers? Why did they make Rio a Raymond? Why did they make Synergy and Earth to Echo ripoff? I don't know. I'm not even sure the filmmakers know. But you know what really pisses me off? More so than the movie obviously not being in the spirit of the cartoon? It's lazy. Criminally so. The music in this movie is nothing more than mass-manufactured pop music. And it's absolutely dreadful. Granted, the music in the cartoon wasn't always great either, but they typically had to write two or three songs per episode. If you write that many songs, they won't all be winners. For the movie, they wrote six. You'd think at least one of them would be decent, if only by accident. I wasn't expecting the music to sound exactly like the cartoon, mind you. If you're going to do a modern retelling of the story, then by all means, update the music accordingly. That's fine. But you can do modern pop music and still put effort into it. I guess whoever wrote this music didn't get that memo. And those six songs only make up about half the music in this movie. The other half is mostly ripped from YouTube. Seriously. Because nothing screams dramatic tension like a couple of high school dudes having a drum off. And it's not just music that they borrowed from YouTube. There's also a buttload of clips of people talking about Jem. And given how fondly they speak of her, I can only assume they're talking about the cartoon and not Gino. And I swear these YouTube clips make up a third of the damn movie. They're everywhere. Hey, why bother filming your own footage when you can just license clips from kids' YouTube channels for a pittance? I hope they were at least paid a pittance. They deserve some compensation for being associated with this shit. And YouTube is not the only internet resource this movie uses. You know how some movies will show a map during a traveling sequence? Gino does that too, but instead of making their own, they just used Google Earth. I cannot believe they actually did this. Even the asylum wouldn't stoop to this level. There are even a couple of shots where they forgot to crop out the Google Earth logo. Look at this shit. I cannot believe how cheap this movie looks. And Gino did not come from some tiny independent studio with no money. This came from Universal. Oh, but of course, they tried to fool us into thinking this movie had some level of class with a few celebrity cameos. Oh yeah, they got a clip of Jimmy Fallon interviewing Alicia Keys, a short interview with Chris Pratt, and some high-quality cell phone footage of The Rock. I wonder how much it cost to get them to appear in this movie. Well, let's see here. The bit with Jimmy Fallon and Alicia Keys was a poorly edited clip from The Tonight Show where they were talking about the cartoon. And since The Tonight Show airs on NBC, which is part of Universal, it's probably safe to say that clip did not cost them a dime. As for The Rock, he was filming Fast and Furious 7 at the time, a Universal picture, so they probably just said, Hey Dwayne, could you take 30 seconds out of your busy schedule and do us a solid and shoot this quick video on your cell phone? Thanks. Again, probably didn't cost them much, if anything. As for the Chris Pratt interview, he was doing that with USA Today to promote the Lego movie, and since they didn't have to pay Mr. Pratt directly for the clip, probably came pretty cheap. And in that video, he was talking about how he used to date some of his sister's Barbie dolls when he was younger, as well as her gem doll. Gem and I dated for like six weeks, it was pretty serious. And in that interview's original context, it was just a harmless joke. And quite funny. But in the context of the movie? Ew! She's about half his age! And when did this relationship supposedly happen? Because she's 18 now, but... Oh god. Oh god, no! Did you put any thought into this at all? You sick bastards! So why did this movie end up looking so cheap? Well, the answer is quite simple. It was cheap. Gino had a budget of just five million dollars, or about two and a half Sharknados. That right there tells you just how much of a shit the studio gave about this movie. They weren't interested in a quality production. They wanted to produce something quickly and cheaply in the hopes of making some easy money. Fortunately, the moviegoers realized the fucking obvious, and their plan backfired big time. Gino made just a hair over two million dollars at the box office, or about one Sharknado, and it was pulled from circulation after just two weeks. Yikes. It also has the distinction of having the fourth worst opening weekend for a very wide release. 
which means it did better than the Oogie Love, so they got that going for them. Maybe that should have been the movie's tagline. Gem and the Holograms. Hey, at least it's not the Oogie Loves. And oh, how the critics hated this movie. Hated it. Even Andre the Black Nerd thought it was terrible. And he likes everything. I don't think I have ever seen a more positive and optimistic person on YouTube. If this guy thought your movie sucked, you done fucked up. For the life of me, I can't imagine how anyone thought this movie would succeed. Sure, it's possible to make a quick buck on a cheap movie, it happens all the time, but this is a major nostalgic property for which many, many people have fond memories. People will go into it with certain expectations, and if you don't treat it with respect, it'll come back to bite you in the ass. At the very fucking least, you have to show some goddamn effort. Say what you will about the Transformers movies, I've said plenty, but Michael Bay and company at least tried to make the best movies they possibly could. Did it work? Not really, no. But they tried. The people who made Gino did not. They tried to take the quick and easy path, and they all fell flat on their faces. And you know what? Good. Laziness should never be rewarded. And when a movie this lazy fails to make back even half its minuscule budget, it reminds me that there is still some justice in this world. So if there's any positive we can take away from Gino, it's that. Well, I think I've ranted long enough here. If you want to experience Gem and the Holograms properly, check out the original cartoon. It's currently streaming on Netflix and also available on DVD. Sure, it's cheesy and low budget and so very, very 80s, but it still has a certain nostalgic charm to it. Or if you want a more modern take on Gem, check out the IDW comic. But stay far away from the movie. Whether you're a Gem fan or not, it ain't worth your time. Well, thank God that's over. Join me next time when we will journey to one of the scariest places on Earth. Detroit. Ugh. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Wait, 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 wait. Hold it right there. I'm so sorry, I almost forgot something. This movie has a mid-credits teaser for a sequel. These people think they're fucking Marvel Studios. I cannot believe they're actually advertising a sequel that has no chance of happening since this movie was doomed to fail from the start. It's just further evidence of how clueless these chuckle fucks truly were. But more than that, it's a taste of what could have been. If you've seen the cartoon before, you've probably been wondering throughout this entire review, where, oh where, are the misfits? Where are Jem's longtime rivals? Guess what? Here they are! Rather than do the sensible thing and put them in the damn movie, they decided in their infinite wisdom to save them for the sequel. Which, again, will never happen. And does she look familiar? Yep, that's Kesha playing the part of Pizzazz. That's fucking brilliant! Our songs are better. We're gonna get her. Where was this movie? This actually had potential! This should not have been the sequel. This should have been the actual movie. We didn't need that stupid-ass backstory with that stupid-ass robot. All we needed are Gem and the Holograms going up against the Misfits. Simple! But since Gino was a spectacular failure, I guess we'll never get that story. Well, not unless someone decides to reboot the franchise ten years down the road. Or probably more like five years. Reboots happen a lot quicker these days. But seriously, if anyone ever makes another Gem movie, Misfits. Put the misfits in the damn movie. This is not complicated. Misfits. Movie. Seriously. And if Kesha still wants to play Pizzazz, let her, because that is perfect casting. Okay, now I'm done. I'll see you next time. And you don't see anybody offering me a TV show. If you're going to have the internet play a good role, fuck, 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 fuck.
Mm. Last line, I almost had it. Ah, oh, 